All righty. All right, everyone, uh, let's get the show started. Welcome to Office Hours. It's January 8th, 2020. Can you believe that? I just can't get over that it's 2020. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the CEO and founder of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator. We help startups own their infrastructure in record time by building it for you and then showing you the ropes. For those of you new to the call, the format of this call is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. Feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. We host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a video of this recording to the Office Hours channel, as well as follow up with an email so you can share it with your team. If you want to share something in private, just ask and we can temporarily suspend the recording. With that said, let's kick this off. Here are some talking points I came up with. Uh, we don't have to get to all of them. It's just uh, things I want to bring up. And uh, first thing is that we now have a syndicated podcast of this Office Hours, which is really cool. Um, it's so easy to do these days with things like Zapier, uh, which relates to one of the other talking points. Um, the next thing is we also have the Sweet Ops job board. Uh, there are a lot of companies hiring that are in our Sweet Ops community. Our goal is to you know, bring everyone together uh, and that this uh, falls in line with that. So if your company is hiring for DevOps or SREs or something adjacent to that, let me know uh, and we can post that to the Sweet Ops job site. Uh, totally free. Then uh, searchable Slack archives. So if you are in our Slack team, you'll know uh, that uh, we are a free team, so we're limited to the 10,000 messages. But uh, we do a, an export of that data, and we post it to uh, the archive, which is archive.sweetops.com. And we've just invested in adding Algolia search indexing to that, so it's a lot easier to discover the content. Uh, and we're continuing to invest in that and to add some other things. The other thing uh, is a public service announcement. Uh, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail later, but basically uh, AWS. Uh, has announced that uh, the uh, CA, the root CA certs for uh, RDS, Aurora, and Document TV will expire on the 5th of March. Uh, I expect like a little mini uh, Y2K kind of bug there for companies doing certificate validation in RDS uh, in March. And uh, then Andrew, uh, is Andrew Roth on the call? Uh, he is not. Well, Andrew had asked, so we might uh, push this if he doesn't show up. Uh, he was curious about uh, how we are doing some of our uh, Slack automation using Zapier, uh, or Zapier, I never know which it is, so I can show that. And if we have time, uh, how we use Cloudflare as kind of like the Swiss army knife uh, to uh, fuse sites together, inject content, and do all kinds of magic uh, with workers. All right, so uh, with that said, let's uh, get the, open the floor up to anyone. Uh, anyone have any interesting uh, comments or problems that they're working with? Uh, hey everyone, this is Brandon. Um, long time no see, it's been a few weeks since I've joined. Just a quick question for, his, uh, for people. Does anyone have a, an ASV that they, uh, they can recommend? I'm looking at um, our, uh, you know, annual PCI uh, external scans coming up and i um, looking for a uh, recommended ASV if anybody has one. I know some people in the um, PCI community. I can probably ask some friends if they have a recommendation. Yeah, just kind of looking for somebody, uh, you know, trusted and uh, decently well-known. Uh, which area are you? Uh, here in Los Angeles. Okay. Cool. I'd be happy uh, to make an intro to uh, Inetian. Uh, they've uh, helped out some of our customers. I've been very uh, pleased with their services. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Brian, nice to see you here. I haven't seen you uh, join for a while. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, I was uh, out of uh, out of the country in December, um, and then spent time with family. Did you were you able to get to the bottom of your issues with Kubernetes uh, and the random pod restarts? Uh, or the 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 
the actual cops uh, worker nodes restarting. Uh, oh, it was actually, yeah, sorry. It was uh, cops worker nodes restarting, correct? Yeah, um, still can't, uh, can't quite pin it yet. Um, nothing in the logs, nothing in the, the kernel logs. Um, it, it's weird, like you'll just see like, um, the the cubit logs and the kernel logs like they'll just go and then they'll have like a one minute of one minute of nothing in the logs and then they'll just say reboot and then they'll mm -hmm. have like the new the new boot on on the worker node um, nothing in EC2 uh, the system status checks everything good um, it's it's interesting just because like we cannot find any logs that show um why the reboot happens we just can see when it happens did uh, uh did you go about implementing those resource limits on the pods i did yeah so um, now everything on the on those boxes have resource limits limits and, and requests okay and uh yeah especially on memory and now are you tracking how much memory uh is being consumed on those boxes and uh, can you see it reaching the upper limit um so so it does reach the upper limit sometimes per pod um it what i haven't quite figured out or i haven't quite tuned perfectly yet is um we have the historical historical data on um on how, how high a pod can go in memory but um now the question is at what point do we say this pod is a rogue pod and it we should kill it versus this pod does need to use this amount of memory for this time being um we should leave it up uh because i don't want to have the limit be too low to the point where our clients are running into issues in the app because the pod is getting killed right you don't want to artificially uh reduce the amount of memory to the pods uh do you know what I'm saying? Uh, like, on average, it will consume one gig of memory. Sometimes, but historically, uh, the data shows that sometimes these pods can go up to five gigs of memory. Do I cut it off at five, or is them getting to five mean that something has gone wrong on that pod? Right. Yeah. Um, it's a, that's a hard one to answer. Uh, does anyone have any uh, insights on this? How have you what said kind of workload is it? Oh, welcome, Andrew. Hey. What kind of workload is it? Yeah. It's just, just a web application. Um, you know, uh, Nginx pod with like. What kind of data though is it serving? Is it, it, it does it spike because uh, users are uploading five gigs of data? Uh, like some. Yeah, we so pod. we do have like. Um, de uh, depend so. So the application does uh, does store like Excel files and and some of the files aren't stored in S3 but like they store like a a minified version of that Excel file in the database. So there are probably large amounts of data being sent uh, periodically but uh, not consistently. So that will cause the spike in memory. Yeah. I mean, keep keep. Uh... If you if you haven't already found a correlation in the app's metrics, then keep, you know, tuning the metrics until you find one, is what yeah. I would say. That yeah, that's a good strategy. So going back to what you're saying though, you don't know where to set that limit. Um, I don't know, I don't know what the impact of the business is uh, by following the advice I'm about to give. That's what you're going to have to decide. But what I would say is, uh, uh, set the set it at what seems reasonable on average and not for the peaks uh, allow some pods to crash or get killed or reaped every now and then for the purpose of seeing if this addresses the stability of the cluster itself if your problems then go away uh that you yeah. aren't you know uh killing the servers well then at least you have identified the problem i think it's better to not cause a reboot of the entire server than to lose a pod every now and then to uh you know memory bursts yeah exactly cool um and did you set up do you have the kubernetes auto scaler set up 
Uh, no, I don't. But uh, at the same time, these pot are uh, these nodes are already massively underscaled in my opinion. Like oh, they are. CPU usage is at forty percent, yeah, and memory usage is at about fifty percent, fifty six. Oh, okay. So it's like um, okay, so. these nodes do have enough resources. Because my only concern um, would be that when you set the memory limits, that now you might be uh, constraining pods from uh, being scheduled. Uh, the Sounds limits, like that's not the problem. If the limits are if the limits are too high, that will constrain them from being scheduled, you say? Yeah, if the limits are too high and you don't have free resources, because it's actually the, up, uh, the requested limit, uh, it's actually allocating so that that is reserved and can't be used by other pods. That's the request. Yeah. That's the request. So not the limit. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm yeah, conflating the two terms. Unless you have a limit ranger that has a max limit then the limit shouldn't I, I have shouldn't the requests matter. lower, uh, much lower, and then the limits higher. Much like um, the requests I have tuned to the average uh, memory usage of a pod, and then the limits I have it to the peak. Okay. Yeah. On the topic of, of pods, I have a question uh, that I've asked in Sweet Ops. I'm curious if anybody has has run into this. Um, just, I have, you know, 1800 pods on uh, of, a, a, of a specific type running on 60 nodes. How do you get those pods to be distributed close to evenly on each node? Oh, I feel, I, I, I've seen something, basically you're looking for something that does rebalancing. Um, and I'd have to look that up. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. My, my issue being like, I have a pretty large difference in memory requests on some nodes versus others. Some nodes are up to the 90s and then some nodes have 40, 50. So it's yeah. like, I want to even out, like, I don't think I need to scale up more nodes. I just need those nodes with 90%, 95% memory requests to, to give those type of pods to the nodes with um, 40, 50. I mean, Kubernetes, Kubernetes tries to do that automatically. But for new yeah. pods, right? Not for existing pods, is it? I don't know. It uh, also yeah. reschedule. I mean, it, if it's... Pod. It won't kill a pod unless it's told to. Unless you know, if if a pod is mer happily running and and you know, unless you have some other functionality that is going through and saying, "I want you to go and go around and start rescheduling pods," you know, Kub by default, Kubernetes, you know, once you schedule a pod and it's there and it's running on a node, it, it's going to keep running. Uh, so like, like if that pod dies and gets restarted, there's no guarantee it's going to restart on the same node that it was before. So uh, one thing, one thing that I'm really interested in that I haven't tried yet myself, but I'm I'm incredibly interested in doing uh, for two reasons. Number one is what we're talking about with the efficient bin packing of of pods across the nodes, but the other reason being um, enforcement of your immutable state is. Uh, automatically restarting all pods in the cluster or, um, you know, whatever pods you have in a whitelist uh, every, you know, X number of hours. Uh, I was talking to, uh, I was in the uh, Ask Me Anything section that uh, Nick Shalon did for the DOD, and they're doing it in their um, DevSecOps, you know, uh, high security clusters that they, every pod gets restarted every, every four hours. That's uh, the same yeah, with, with um, Notify right now because I'm too lazy to write a cron job because it rescapes uh, Helm uh, shards on startup. So I just kill it every couple of minutes, uh, hours. Uh, what were you using for that, you said? 
uh, just timeout. Oops. Okay. Oh yeah, you're. Uh, that's a smart uh, trick, right? So what he's saying <laughs> is uh, your entry point script. If you just add that, if you just add the timeout command, uh, then you can have your pod automatically cycle itself. Um, uh, this is optimistically, right? Uh, that you have yeah, of course. That they won't all do it at the same time, which is un unlikely, but could technically happen. And also, it's a hard kill of the process, I imagine. So. Like if you have existing connections, it will just cut yeah. off the connection. Yeah, it's not great. Time, so it's like, yeah. uh, timeout is actually a uh, sick term. It's not sick kill. Oh, okay. So you can actually handle that in the application. Your app has to, yeah, if your ha app handles the sick term gracefully. That's cool. Also, I, so I shared to office hours. Uh, it looks like there's a project out there. It's called Descheduler. Uh, and it will uh, wake up when it thinks the cluster is unbalanced and uh, start uh, uh, killing pods off uh, so that they get uh, res rescheduled. I would argue that that is not super necessary. You know, because if, if, I mean, yeah, sure, if a node is, you know, getting full, but everything's running fine, so what? Yeah. Um, uh, more or less, yes, yes, it yes, comes down to the spikes, though, right? So if you have an overloaded uh, node, overloaded being a subjective term, but uh, let's say it's running at 80% capacity, everything's hunky dory, and then Brian's cluster, this one pod gets that request that causes the memory to spike five gigs. That's what he wants to avoid. So if on average it's more balanced, I think the probability of that causing problems is less. Um, and we're assuming that that misbehaving pod doesn't have a, a limit on it. Oh, well, it, uh, well, now they do, but, uh, but it could still be, um, well, if, if you're at 90, like 99 or 96% memory requests, you don't have much of a pool of memory left. At least for me, I have R4 two XLs. Yeah. Um, I mean, so what, it's not like, yeah, go ahead. it's not like, it's not like all my nodes are there at 99, 96, 97%, but some of them are, but then there are on the other side, there are other nodes that are at 30, 40% requests. So I want, I want to be able, like, I want to get to a point where obviously all of them are at like around 80% memory requests with a 20% uh, pool of memory for when you do spike up to five, five gigs of memory because I, I do see these spikes but they're very short I so think that's too high I, I, uh 80% is too high yeah I think 80% is too high I mean all, my clusters are at like 40% memory request um uh, maybe, maybe no they're at memory 40% memory usage memory oh, requests but what about requests? I don't know I don't I don't I'm not sure what the requests are so for me, the uh, I have nodes between thirty percent request memory request and ninety nine percent memory request. I w I'm struggling to get them all to like seventy eighty percent memory request. Um, actual memory usage on each node is about forty fifty percent. Actually, no, I take that back. Fifty sixty percent. All right. I do think this this schedule. But I would say, you know, I, to make a general statement, I would say don't sweat it too much, you know, unless things are going wrong. Uh, I'm sweating it because I have these nodes that just reboot every week and a half, randomly. Um, I, ha I, I, uh, this is my best theory right now is that every single time these node reboots, their memory requests are really high. It's in the 90s every single time. Oh, okay. Um, tell, tell. So, I mean, because I can't find anything in the kernel logs and the kubelet logs, this is my best bet right now. Uh, yeah. That that's, It's kind of why I've gone down this rabbit hole. Um, I'm not 100% sure if this is the reason why it's happening, but um, it's my best bet right now just because I don't see anything in the logs. 
The other interesting thing, uh, just a theory, uh, but I'm not sure if it would help, um, would be if you did have the autoscaler enabled, uh, what you will see is nodes more frequently getting replaced. So that would automatically also impact the rebalancing of pods across the cluster. Uh, now, that, that may or may not alleviate the problem. For example, if you were using SpotInst, uh, like uh, the, 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 the service, uh, you would be replacing pot, uh, nodes uh, all day long, every day uh, throughout the week. And that would also yep. uh, keep uh, the OS fresh on all those boxes and uh, the pods uh, continually uh, getting rescheduled. I, ha I have these ephemeral clusters. So like some, some of these EC2 nodes are um, four or five days old and then they'll reboot. So that yeah. initially, Previously, we had uh, clusters that were up for longer, maybe three, four months, and we'll get that maintenance reboot, which yeah. is on the hardware. Um, but you'll see that in like CloudWatch, it'll say um, the EC2 system health or whatever, or, uh, whatever, um, or system status check uh, caused the reboot. But this is like a service level reboot, not a EC2 host reboot. Okay. Uh, any uh, any other questions related to Terraform, DevOps, security, AWS? Uh, as no, I mentioned, I oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, no, I, I, um, I'm going to start digging into the AWS ECS web example a little bit. I'm preparing a eight hour training session for oh, my friends right. here. Um, and uh, I, the, perhaps the next, um, once I dig into it a little bit more, I may have questions, but um, I didn't see an EKS example, so that's why I just went straight to the ECS one. Oh, we definitely have examples of all of that stuff. Let me show you. Um, get out of the full screen here. Uh, and this goes for uh, pretty much all of our modules, especially those that have been upgraded to um, Terraform 0 0.12 support. Yeah, that's kind of why I'm not using my packages is because I don't really want to bother with trying to update them all. <laughs> and uh, yeah, what better way than, than to also start contributing to. Uh, yeah. So like here, let's take an example with the uh, AWS EKS cluster. Uh, so one of the things we've done is under um, test and source, we've implemented uh, some basic uh, terror test examples that bring up the cluster, ensure that the nodes connect, uh, and then uh, tear it down uh, wh when everything uh, is done or if it fails. Uh, so here you can see like the logic for waiting until the worker joins the cluster. And this has enabled us then to accept pull requests much faster for the EKS uh, modules. Now, if you go into the examples complete folder, here is where we have, this is not saying this is a reference architecture. This is a minimally viable example of how to get the EKS cluster up uh, and that should be per, uh, you know, sufficient for uh, your uh, uh, class. So uh, as you know, our modules are very composable. So then there's uh, one, uh, we, we first bring up the VPC, we provision the subnets, uh, and then we provision the workers uh, and the EKS cluster. Uh, and then the work, this, this worker node pool is then connected uh, to this cluster. Okay, sweet. Yeah, I'll take a look into this then. Um, I'm not sure I want to overwhelm my students with all of that at the same time, but I definitely want to reference if you are interested in uh, using Kubernetes to kind of go down that path. Yeah, Kubernetes, uh, there's a lot of complexity there. And I mean, now as it relates to ECS, um, I think our, our ECS implementation is more on the advanced side uh, of how to do ECS and isn't like the hello world example of ECS. Uh, so it, just keep that in mind as well. I, I know I'm kind of unselling our module there, but uh, the point is that our modules are designed for advanced use cases um, and uh, have a lot of degrees of variation, uh, configuration rather. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, It can be tough. I learned ECS through the module, uh, but I ended up writing my own after that. Um, mm -hmm. Especially like with um, the test definition that you have 
it's kind of funky like <laughs> the way you do you guys do it through the module so it, it might be better to just put yeah. the JSON. You know, but, th but this is a complaint I have about using ECS in general, uh, especially with CI CD. The fact that you need to use a heavy handed tool like Terraform to deploy a new task, uh, it it's like the wrong tool for, for the job. Uh, uh, the yeah, I so have quite I an experience that, with that. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I work with ECS deploy, uh, which is a Python script for that. Right. Uh, and it just like, don't uh, deactivate your old tasks. So Terraform still thinks that they are active and then won't try to modify them. So yeah, that's the trick I did for CI CD. It's not ideal, but it works. Uh, and and this is why I find, I, yeah, so uh, this is one of the, uh, t uh, the complaints I have with ECS and Terraform is the deployment part. And this is, this would be true if you were also choosing to use Terraform to do your deployments uh, to Kubernetes. But uh, many of us do not use Terraform uh, for those deployments, and therefore we don't have that same kind of challenge. And the thing is, it could be quite easily solved by Terraform. The only issue what they do is basically if there's an inactive, instead of taking the late, latest task definition, they just stick to the one they have. And if it's inactive, then it consider it dead instead of like looking up inside the, the, all the task definition online and then just taking the latest one. So I think yeah, that's a shortcoming. Of different strategies that it yeah. uh, could take. Uh, that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate y'all's help on, the, on that. And definitely we'll be chiming back in once I start digging into it more. Yeah, uh, feel free to ask away in the Terraform channel if you get blocked. Uh, I'm sure our savior, uh, Andre, will help out. So, um, in the vacation time, I got into an argument with some friends that needed some help with their Kubernetes cluster. And they wanted to scale their services, um, some uh, TensorFlow stuff, um, based on latency. And I was like, Scaling on latency is something that I've never done and would never do. And then we argued why it is a bad thing. And I just wanted to know how you scale, like imagine provisioning in HPA. Um, how how do you scale on which kind of metrics? Um, I guess CPU and memory is the most common one, but um, I think latency, if you have a downstream error with the database. Or exactly. Something, you just, you, you, yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's why I was like, no, don't do it. But they were like pretty like persistent on it. I was like, it's something for an alert, but not for scaling your pods. It, and it, um, yeah, I just would like to get your input um, because I mean, I handled it pretty well. I guess the argument is over and we decided on doing something <laughs> else. But I mean, it's like kind of like how do you guys scale, for example? I would just like to know. Um, First of all, the arguments you have during uh, the holidays are very different than the arguments I have uh, during holidays. No politics, none of, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> different kinds of uh, family discussions. Um, now, you brought up the, the great point, right? Like in an academic setting, like devoid of reality and all the other things that can go wrong, scaling on latency seems like a great idea. Except for in reality, it's usually because of all these upstream problems that you have no control over. And like if the database slow down, your latency goes up. So you scale out more uh, 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 workers, uh, which slam the database even more. So it slows down even more. And then you have a, a catastrophic failure. Everything falls down. Uh, so I think that when you scale or how you scale it, and this is a cop out, I hate to say it. It depends a lot on what you're building. You, okay, so you said TensorFlow, right? Um, yeah. Let's see. I don't each have... pod had like uh, 12 gigs of memory allocated to them. Uh, I think it was four CPUs. Um, so it was pretty hefty pods. It was about yeah. something small. Um, so, yeah. so let's see here if I remember this correctly. Uh, I. It was uh, a year and a half ago or so, we actually, were, we did a project with Caltech and uh, using uh, COPS and HPA and TensorFlow. Uh, and they uh, have a Redis queue uh, with 
uh, all the, the tasks in there, I believe, or the images or something that they needed to process. And uh, they then wrote a custom HPA uh, autoscaler. There's a great, there are a lot of examples on how to do a custom um, uh, setup uh, for that. And so they wrote a custom one that just looks at the size of the Redis queue and then scales the, um, the, the pods based on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, this was more like a traditional HTTP application. So you basically sent your um, data via post and then it was doing language processing, was one of the services, other one was image processing. They had a lot of traffic. They had like 50,000 requests per second. I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, that is yeah. a lot. Um, I don't know what they're analyzing. I didn't ask, but it's like, yeah, there's spots for image processing, there's spots for language processing. Um, the AWS cluster had 140 nodes or something, all with 64 gigs of RAM. It was kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, um, so yeah, that's what like, I'd love to have. Yeah, it is. It is. I was like, I was really interested in it, but it's like, yeah, my counterpart was a, um, a scientist and he was like, yeah, we are using Kubernetes. Our SRE team doesn't have time. I want to help. I was like, okay, give me a contract. I will sign and give me money and I will look at it. it worked quite well, but it's like, yeah, <laughs> this, the argument that I had with him was kind of like, mm, meh, but yeah. Yeah. I, I I think at the scale that they're doing this example uh, kind of isn't going to be helpful, but for what it's worth, here is uh, that autoscaler and that stuff is all defined in this kiosk. Um, and I'll share it in this channel, in the office hours channel. Okay. Any, uh, any other interesting questions, guys? I have a question like um, regarding Kubernetes, like if you have servers that require um, direct TCP mapping, I have an ambassador in front of it. So I was wondering like how easy or how hard it is to get the raw socket there for a couple of pods and then do a little balancing. If you have raw TCP sockets. Let's see if uh, I just to uh, say it in my own words. Uh, wait, you want a you want a, uh, a dedicated IP per service? I don't or, really care about the dedicated TCP IP? mapping. I didn't understand. Uh, well, basically, I have like a couple of servers that are have uh, only raw socket connections, and yeah. I'm trying to route them using Ambassador. Uh, well, okay. it doesn't really matter, but like. Yeah something in front of it so they can have like a unique IP with a different public port and then just map to, to the internal port. Gotcha. Uh, I don't have any uh, feedback on that one. Somebody else uh, want to chime in? Maybe with the uh, ambassador experience? Uh, alternative to Nginx or Envoy? What, what, Sorry, go on. Yeah, hey, Eric, this is Carlos. Uh, got a question. Uh, anybody play with EKS for Windows, Windows worker nodes? <laughs> I'm, I'm the one that I'm about to get uh, uh, working on that. You're a brave man coming here like that. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, no. I saw you created the channel, uh, Windows, in Sweet Up. So uh, thank you for that. I guess it's about time. Uh, <laughs> Windows is not the, yeah, it's not the uh, same OS it used to be. But yeah, I, I can't help with that. Someone else here maybe we can. Just, I, I doubt anybody's touching it, uh, but I thought of asking. Yeah. I'm dreading the day I'll have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming though. It's in the future. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, I'm dreading it, so but it's, it is what it is. <laughs> The last time I had to do Windows Nodes, I used Azure Service Fabric. And it sucked. Mm. Cool. 
Cool. Uh, let's see here. So uh, Andrews, uh, since you're on the call and you had asked uh, a week or so ago or two weeks ago over the holidays, kind of like, how do we do these uh, channel notifications? Actually, perfect segue uh, because Carlos was the one who uh, recently created this channel here. Uh, so how do we uh, set up this automatic notification when new channels come up? Uh, so it's a pretty uh, quick and easy uh, demo. Uh, basically, let's see here, I have a link here somewhere. So uh, do many of you guys use Zapier today or Zapier? I never know how you say it. I use it for our CIM integration with one of our projects. Uh, my mouse has. Okay, here we go. So yeah, this is just a deep link into our uh, account so I don't have to search around for it. This is the zap that we have that uh, handles that. So basically with uh, Zapier you can have all, all these uh, different integrations to the products you use, Gmail, Slack, uh, MySQL, Postgres, uh, GitHub, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, uh, the, uh, the application is when a, a new channel is uh, discovered via a webhook integration, uh, then uh, it will, um, there's an example of when I set this up this was a year ago, but uh, then uh, here's the metadata that came back and uh, who created that channel. So then we can just jump over to the next message, which with next step, which is to uh, send a custom channel message. And, and what I love about it is you can really customize everything about that message and how it gets sent. And it makes it very easy to just add fields uh, uh, that are available from any of that data that was passed from the previous step. Um, and we've taken this to, uh, to the extreme, like uh, in, in our account, uh, we have, let's see here. In our account, we, we handle almost 20,000 uh, uh, zaps uh, every month. And we have over 111 of these uh, across uh, you know, our, our company and what we do to automate various aspects from things that happen in Gmail, things that happen in QuickBooks, things that happen in build.com, all that we automate, send it into our Slack channel uh, as kind of like a simplified view for what's going on. What's the difference between a zap and a task? I could just be overloading. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. No, exactly. It's like so, I'm looking at the pricing, and it's like, okay, the free plan, you get five zaps and a hundred tasks task per month. Task is an execution. So a zap is the is like the code is the program. Oh, okay. So you get unlimited programs, and then how many executions of that? Okay. So um, it, it, another way of thinking about it, especially now that they have uh, code steps, so you can run JavaScript, you can run Python code. So it's, it's almost like just a, uh, a GUI for doing lambdas, and then they provide all the integrations to all these different services, and it becomes the glue uh, to tie everything together. The downside, uh, since this is a DevOps-oriented uh, uh, group, there's no API. Ironically, there's no API to Zapier. Uh, it, it's really strange. And because there's no API to Zapier, there's also no zaps to automate Zapier in that way, which is unfortunate. So you can't do Zapier as code. No Terraform module or anything? No, so disappointing. <laughs> Um, what happens when you run out of your 20,000 you know, 20, tasks or whatever? Uh, it's a shelf. It sucks. They, they require you to upgrade to the next uh, plan. They don't have uh, an overage uh, model. So, so, if, you, uh, so if, uh, if by the 16th I uh, max out uh, this 1,000 zaps here, I'm going to have to upgrade again another hundred bucks a month or whatever yeah or so so 
so we create 1,000 channels now. And um, well, I sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. <laughs> I mean, so we create 1,000. Everybody go create channels. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> hey, stop! Bad <laughs> idea. Don't do that. <laughs> How can we cost Eric money? Well, that's bad. Uh, Don't do that. Okay. Yeah. That's funny. Okay. How much is it per execution? It, it seems like it's, that. It seems like. It seems like it would be not that hard to rut, to create, you know, a Lambda or something that you hook together with a... Spoken a, like a true uh, developer, my friends. Spoken like a fruit, true developer. I could you, build with this Slack, you can With Slack, you can set up webhooks. Yeah. No, and, and uh, the reality is there's a open source um, Zapier alternative. It's, just the, it's the old, you know, buy versus build. Type yeah. of mentality. Uh, it was just posted on Hacker News or something. Uh, Hugens, Hugens or Hogan's with H, right? Hugens yeah. or something? Yeah, well, you see it there. Uh, H U G I N, I think. H U G. H U. Uh, something like that. Create agents that monitor and act on your behalf. Like I, I'm so blind here. Agents that yeah. H u g i n n. Oh, you just skip it. Just go back. <laughs> just... This is the funny thing. Yeah, just go back up, up. There you got it. The first oh, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Blindness. Wow. Okay. It was on Hacker News uh, like two months ago or one month ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh... So, you know, I, I think it's one of those things, uh, depending on what you want to accomplish, uh, that could be great. Um, also, a lot of the Zapier uh, integrations are actually on their GitHub. I, did, I just realized the other day. So uh, they're open source, uh, so you can uh, PR them um, if you need to. It'd be interesting if something like um, Hugen uh, actually worked with Zapier plugins, but I don't think he does. Yeah, it's also not really, oh, well, it is maintained. I was like, it's not any more maintained, but yeah, it is. Um, uh, yeah, so let's see here. Here are the agents that it supports where the, your, oh, this is a screenshot. So I don't know how many agents it supports today. Uh, I think that's the main thing to, main consideration is like, when you go to apps here, there are literally, I think there's thousands of integrations that it has. Yeah, 1,500. So it, it's quite a lot. And, and anyone who's worked with third-party APIs knows they break all the time. They uh, upgrade, they change. So you might get it working you know, on yeah. a weekend, uh, but it's going to break uh, three weeks from now, and then you're never going to get back to it because now you, you're not on holiday break anymore. Right. Okay, cool. Thanks. Cool. Any other uh, questions about this or something else? Anybody using Podman yet? <laughs> nope. I know that it came up uh, a few weeks or uh, a month or so ago, I know, on uh, Office Hours. If this, uh, if this is, um, what was it? Hold on. I'm just curious if anyone's uh, kicked the tires on this project. It's, uh, I think it's in the incubator, uh, CubeSphere. Have any of you guys seen CubeSphere? So like, like a Kubernetes dashboard or what does it do? Yeah, yeah, but it, uh, it, it combines a lot of things. Um, and it's kind of interesting. If you look under the hood on the architecture of what it uses, it's pretty similar to the components that, uh, well, so first of all, here's the UI. So, you know, uh, pictures you know, are always pretty. So it's a nice UI of everything operating in the system. You could say it's maybe somewhere, something like an open shift, but maybe not as opinionated or as complicated. Uh, it, I believe it deploys entirely on Kubernetes, unlike OpenShift, which you have to have control over the host OS. Um, 
they have a demo environment you can log in and check out. But here's the architecture I thought was interesting. Let's see if, why is this not loading. Uh, it looks like Rancher. Or Rancher, yeah. Sure. Like, uh, yeah, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the, the screenshots going, wait, this isn't Rancher? <laughs> yeah, uh, it looks They're like so the, similar. It looks like the uh, uh, GitHub camo proxy has bungled this image here, so I can't view it. And maybe you can. I oh know. So let me open up in the uh, incognito window. Maybe that helps. So anyone Rancher using though, Rancher in production yet? Rancher though uses mostly their own in-house components though, right? Uh, and, and isn't built on, aside from Kubernetes of course, which it builds on, uh, but it's a lot of in-house things versus this, it's, it looked like, ah, I can't see it. What's well, what you would see here is that it uses um, uh, like Jenkins under the hood, it uses, um, uh, Prometheus and Grafana and uh, I think it's had Fluentd and it, it, it looked like very much the similar stack that we we're using today. I was going to deploy the um, NUTS operator and I saw it also deploys its own Prometheus and then it's kind of like annoying that everyone and everything is deploying its own dependencies a little bit. I kind of like I see it all the time and it annoys me. I don't know. Well, you, you were, you were uh, deploying, what was it? Nuts, uh, it's a pops up alternative. Oh. Um, and the operator of Nets also deploys Prometheus and Grafana and all that stuff. And it's like, I have why? a Prometheus operator. Yeah. Why, is it, uh, open is why does the same. every service want to bundle Prometheus with it? Yeah, OpenFast is doing the same. It's like, yeah, okay, I get it, you need it, but it's like, it's yeah. always included right now. It's like, yeah. So, uh, so from experience, I think I know have the answer now uh, to that. Uh, but uh, I am equally frustrated. So we uh, we we support a product called KubeCost. Uh, we have a channel for that in uh, SweetOps, the KubeCost channel there. And QCost is a cost uh, like vis visualization tool for Kubernetes and your uh, cloud pla uh, your um, cloud provider. So like AWS, uh, it also supports GKE, and it'll show you how much uh, that's costing in, in real time uh, estimations, of course. But uh, it too ships its own version of Prometheus, and I, you know, I, I shook my fist at them and said, "Why are you doing this to us? You know, we, we spent a lot. Like scaling Prometheus is non-trivial. You can't just like throw up Prometheus." Uh, and expect it to actually work in production. You, you can do it for a great example and make your charts very you know, presentable, but it's not the way forward. And then worse yet, they didn't support a way to have your, bring your own Prometheus, so that, that made it worse. Well, we spent probably like a month of integration effort trying to get uh, their cube cost working with our Prometheus, and it's just there's so many settings and there's so many assumptions and there's so many things that make everyone's Prometheus installation kind of different, uh, especially, I guess, if you're not maybe using Prometheus Operate. So uh, I guess the reason why all these vendors are shipping it is because most people, A, lack Prometheus uh, operational experience, B, uh, know how to set it up the right way, uh, and C, they, they got to have a successful uh, product install in the first five minutes, or the people are just going to you know, get bored and walk away. So I, I guess that's why Nats is doing that too. I, I can understand it. It's just like, it's for, for, I mean, it's not even using it for scaling or something. It's just like for monitoring. It's, it doesn't have any use. It's not utilized at all for auto scaling or something else. It's just like it's there. Yeah. So I, I, guess, <laughs> I guess what we got to get more comfortable or like, this is not the right word maybe or, so, I mean, uh, built in Prometheus, the architecture is pretty nice, right? Prometheus can scrape other Prometheuses. So I guess what we, yeah. should, so I, I guess really what uh, we should be adopting is uh, a pattern of more, uh, getting more comfortable with just scraping other Prometheuses uh, and aggregating it rather than expecting all these third party services to use our Prometheus. 
Yeah, I'm just looking at the memory usage of the Prometheus at OpenPASTI Plus, for example, and it's not much. It's uh, 150 megabyte, um, megabyte, but it's like, still, I, it's just a noise. It, I federate it and I scrape it basically from yeah. my Prometheus operator, and, but it's still, um, it's like one more component that you have to worry about, and it's the same component. And if someone tells you, hey, my Prometheus is not working, which one is it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so, have you guys used Titan or other like aggregator for Prometheus? Uh, uh, like storage backends? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, it's more to, like a federation, also. Oh. Okay. No, I only uh, at my old job I built a Azure function to actually save everything to Bob Storage. Export and save to block storage to have it accessible there. Oh, yeah. uh, it, this came up uh, uh, recently also when talking uh, with a customer. And also, I know Andrew uh, Roth, he, he does what we're doing. And uh, I was actually going to chime in and say, give an update. So uh, now it's been probably two, three months operating Prometheus on EFS uh, for a production cluster. And it's working well, but uh, there were some growing pains along the way. Um, the two biggest problems we had was one was uh, if you don't have the memory limits set correctly on Prometheus, uh, over time uh, it will just uh, crash. And when it crashes, it leaves these wall files around and you, it can't auto recover uh, uh, after that. You have to exec into the container and delete those wall files. The other interesting thing we noticed with Prometheus is, so uh, I forget what version it is, but the latest version of uh, Prometheus, um, op under Prometheus operator, this is secondhand. Uh, one of my team's uh, team members was uh, relating this to me, so uh, forgive me if there's some uh, loss of precision here, uh, is that it will auto discover what your memory limits should be for Prometheus when you deploy it, uh, which is cool. However, we noticed that when it was uh, auto-discovering those limits, uh, if we didn't have at least a minimum of 11 gigs available to Prometheus, then uh, it didn't matter what it set those limits to automatically. It would always uh, uh, inch up against that uh, hard limit and then get killed by the, the uh, memory reaper uh, on, in the Linux kernel. So once we bump that up to 15 gigs, it's now staying uh, under that limit and uh, being respectful of everything and it works. We didn't dig deeper into why it didn't work uh, for when it was just under allocated. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we have uh, five more minutes here. Uh, any final thoughts or interesting uh, news articles? What do you have on your your agenda that we haven't talked about yet? Oh, uh, there's one thing, but I don't want to. I don't want to waste five minutes and rush through it. Uh, I think I think you guys will uh, dig this. Uh, this uh, using how to use Cloudflare as a Swiss Army knife, um, and uh, kind of like we use uh, Zapier for the same thing. Uh, you can do a lot of nice, dirty, nasty hacks with Cloudflare and workers, uh, and we're doing that now. Uh, so I wanted to show how you can do uh, content injection, page rewrites, um, uh, all, and proxy basically any site you want. I did a little bit with Cloudflare uh, not too long ago, and I was thrilled with the quality of the Terraform uh, mm. provider for Cloudflare. I was able to set everything up in Terraform. Yeah. No, I know they're investing a lot in that. Uh, I think a couple of the, the, the people involved on in that project are actually in SweetOps. Um, and I know and they've actually reached out to Cloud Posse um, uh, on, on their Terraform provider uh, for feedback. Oh, OK. Cool. So yeah, they are. They, okay. We're on the radar. One small project I've seen is uh, a couple of months ago. I just posted the link in the channel. It's a uh, native policy management for Kubernetes. It seems nice. It's a company like, I don't remember which company. 
but they, they gave a presentation and it seemed interesting for like, you can set this policy for like example, every node needs to have uh, limits set in your cluster or mm -hmm. they have more complex examples and then it evaluates like which pods are in non-compliance with your policies and then also blocks new deployments uh, that That's don't respect cool. your policies. So I, I like thought it was cool. Yeah, a pretty simple um, uh, yeah. way to express it. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. This feels very native to Kubernetes. Yeah, I guess it's there. Has someone already tried out OPA um, for Terraform plants? Uh, or policy agent, because I wanted mm. to do a policy agent that basically fails or um, basically you need an approval if there's only a delete happening. It's just like if something new added, it just auto approves and runs through to, through the CI. Stuff like that I wanted to try out. Um, sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Yeah, uh, so uh, some plans, uh, now this is, uh, you know, probably a topic for um, uh, another office hours. But one of the things I really want to try and uh, do with this office hours now in 2020 is uh, more demos and uh, more demos by our members. So I know a lot of you are doing some cool things, cool things that we don't have a chance to do ourselves or see. Uh, I would like to see that. So if you guys are working with, for example, with OPA or if somebody uh, kicks the tires on uh, Kiverno, uh, I would uh, really like to get a demo of that. Uh, also, maybe we can uh, get some nice uh, other speakers um, onto uh, office hours so we can ask them questions. I really want to get uh, Mamushu on here. Uh, Mamushu is a prolific uh, GitHub contributor uh, to the Kubernetes um, ecosystem. I thought about something cool that uh, my team is, is starting to do a lot of work with Helmfile and something that I don't think Helmfile has yet that we miss from uh, Terraform is uh, that Terraform docs uh, command. Yes. If, if there was like a Helm file docs command where ah. you can, uh, you know, where it would generate a table of all the, you know, uh, environment variable inputs. That'd yeah, awesome. that would be cool. Yeah, that'd be cool. We thought about doing something like that. Yeah, uh, well, you know, you know, at least uh, float the idea in the Helm file channel, right? And uh, let's see if there's some more interest uh, in something like this. Uh, auto documentation for Helm file. Yeah, I'm having to write out the table right now because we, we're doing a big one for, for uh, Git, GitLab. Mm -hmm. And there's, oh, you know, we've got, yeah. yeah, and we've got like 60 input variables for everything. It, it can get unwieldy, I agree uh, with any, <laughs> and then the more anything, the more you parameterize anything, the harder it is to actually deploy. Yeah. Cool. We discovered that um, the environments um, don't really work the way we expected them to, and we weren't able to really use them the way we wanted them to. Um, if you if you're going to have a Helm file and its purpose is to be a sub Helm file, meaning like I've got a Helm file for GitLab and the end user is going to create their own Helm file and then it's going to have, you know, Helm files, path, you know, git colon whatever, GitLab, git colon whatever, key cloak, git colon whatever, you know, that. Um, if the sub Helm file has environments in it, your root Helm file needs to have those environments declared and it can't have any other environments. Yeah, you have to do, you have to, exactly. It, it's kind of an artifact of how Helm file was implemented um, and the path of least resistance. But yeah, those environments need to be declared uh, if they exist in all Helm files uh, where they get included, I believe. Yeah, so we ended up scrapping that idea and just doing it because what we wanted it was, um, you know, we talked earlier about how I don't, I don't like how Helm charts default to, you know, uh, insecure by default. I want secure by default. So our Helm file is going to be the opinionated secure way that we want you to deploy Helm file by default. And then there's an environment variable called local mode or whatever that you can turn on that 
sets all the other variables for you into the insecure mode. Yeah. You know, so instead of having to set all kinds of stuff, you know, by reading documentation and going, oh, okay, what do I have to do here? Yeah. You have no. to run on my freaking laptop. Just do like local mode equals true and then it'll run on your laptop. Yeah. So we were originally going to do like the default environment was production and then uh, environment called local, but that didn't end up working out. Uh, I'd be happy if you want to share a little bit of that uh, next call or in a future one, I'd be happy to look over that and see if there's uh, another way of uh, doing it or uh, some feedback um, based on our experience. Sure. Cool. All right, everyone. Uh, looks like we've reached the end of the hour. Uh, that about wraps things up. Thanks again for sharing. I always learn so much uh, from you guys uh, on these calls. Uh, a recording of this call will be posted in the Office Hours channel. Uh, see you guys next week. Same place, same time. Have a nice one. Bye-bye. You do. Take care.